Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for those who are here and our viewers who are online. We are grateful that you have made time to sit at the feet of Jesus. I'm usually encouraged by the words that Jesus spoke to uh, Mary uh, that, you know, what you have chosen, no one can take away from you being at the feet of Jesus. May the good Lord bless us for this brief moment of reflection. Uh, it's a Bible study, but also I would desire it to be more of a reflection. Uh, at least for those who desire to ask, we'll have a brief moment. I'll intentionally create that moment for us to ask questions. For now, allow me to pray with you, and then we can read the Word of God and have a few um, uh, reflections on the Word. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful again. We have had such a good moment uh, during lunch. We thank you for provision as we are cognizant that there are people at this moment, Lord, struggling to have something to eat, but it's granted for us. I pray, O oh God, for provision for them too, even as we um, encourage and stir each other up to share that which you have provided for us. Bless us as we open your word. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to open the book of Matthew 12, uh, 25. The book of Matthew 25. Uh, we are still in the, in, the, in the mood of community service, reflecting on to that call of community service. And therefore, most of our teachings are geared towards that end. And I want to look at two verses, and then we see... Uh, I will read this verse, and then I read a text from the Spirit of Prophecy, and then invite you to a reflection. Um, Matthew 25, I'm reading verse 35 and 36. Matthew 25... Uh, verse 35 and 36. The Bible says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and, need, uh, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. I guess this too is a very, very uh, common text that we have encountered. We have used it uh, in calling uh, people to assist us uh, in moments of need. Uh, but today we are seated as a church in trying to rally ourselves in how can we respond uh, to a text such as this. Uh, first of all, the interesting part of this text is the fact that it is set in, um, in a context where Jesus is speaking about the final days, about the end of time. And he has given, in chapter 24, he has given a litany of what we expect to see before the end of time. He said before the end of time, uh, there will be deceptions such like we are seeing today. There will be rumors of war, there will be sickness, nation raising up against nations, and he continues to speak about many of the things that we are witnessing today. The question that one would ask is, does it mean that in the days of Jesus there were no wars? And we find that there were actually wars fought in the time of Jesus which are, were more ferocious than the wars we see today. But why does Jesus pinpoint these things to be as signs of the end? It could only be for one reason, probably, if there is any other two. But one thing that I could think of is Jesus looked in the day of which men could uh, consider themselves capable of taking, about, taking, taking care of all these problems, taking care of the wars, taking care of the famines, taking care of sickness, uh, we, we, with all the ma man's wisdom, but yet still, in that moment, we see that things are happening 
of which are not pleasant like words, with the Organization of African Unity, with the, with the UN, uh, you know, all these uh, human efforts just to bring about peace, but there is still no peace or human effort to ensure that humanity is enjoying favorable uh, climates of life, good um, uh, health, but still with the World Health Organization, but still we are failing. I, I tend to think that could be, this is why Jesus says in that time, then these things will become a sign of his coming. And then he continues to speak about, you know, he was answering the three questions that the disciples posed in verse 3 when they asked him, when shall these things be? And when shall be, the, what will be the sign? And, uh, and the signs of your coming and also of the end. Three questions that they ask. And therefore Jesus in Matthew 24 uh, goes on to answer them. And then uh, he says somewhere, um, as you go further in verse 39, that, and, in, okay, in verses um, 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 going down, he says, On this day no man knoweth. No one knows when the Son of Man will come. And therefore the disciples would wish to know then, how would they prepare for his coming? Given that the day will come suddenly, how would one prepare for his coming? And Jesus enters into uh, um, a litany of stories. He begins by telling them the story of a faithful servant. And he goes to the story of the ten virgins. In all these stories, Jesus seeks to tell the disciples how they should wait for him. Of the ten virgins, he tells them that you ought to wait for the Lord as those who are aware that the Lord will delay his coming. And for that reason, you should be like the wise virgins carrying along some extras for the delay. Then he goes further to talk about talents, the, the parable of the talents. He says, we need to wait for the Lord, not in idleness and in indolence or indulgence, but we need to wait for the Lord engaged in exploiting uh, the gifts and talents that he, is, uh, he has given to us. So we need to wait for the Lord knowing that he would delay, but you also need to wait with, for the Lord, engage with what he has entrusted us with, be it time, be it talent, whatever the Lord has bestowed upon you. And after saying this parable, he enters into this last part of chapter 25, where we are reading these two texts. He speaks about the sheep and the goats. Now he says that when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. I don't intend to teach on, the part, on this teaching, but I want us just to see now another part of how the Lord expects us to wait for him. He does not only expect us to wait for him knowing that he would delay. In fact, Jesus was intentional that he knew the disciples ought to know there will be many disappointments in the sense of people hoping that he's coming soon and he doesn't come soon. And therefore he tells them, always have this extra. Don't rely on yesterday's graces. Amen? Don't rely on the grace and the goodness of God that you enjoyed yesterday. Continue cultivating a relationship on each moment, each hour, each day. Because the delay is quite eminent. It's most likely that the Lord is not coming soon as much as coming soon but we don't know how soon and therefore don't rely and that is why sometimes children of God um, we see the problem that comes with some of our conditions where we tend to rely you know and fail to take advantage of opportunities that the Lord extends to us one of our sisters a colleague of mine in college recently um, uh, shared a very interesting message of how we need to take op we need to take opportunity of the ordinaries the ordinaries and I, I remember an illustration that she gave and said you know most of the time people uh, swing between high moments and forget the ordinary moments of their existence where they could also um, um, enjoy much of God's blessings meaning like now some people are waiting for the camp meeting a high moment 
and then they wait for a week of prayer, a high moment. But what happens between a high, the camp meeting and, and the week of prayer? What happens in between here? And yet this is the moment of true growth, this ordinary, what you could consider ordinary moments. And this is what Jesus addresses with the parable of the ten uh, virgins or the wise virgins, that you need an extra, and that extra does not come during high moments, the extras come during the low moments or the ordinary moments. So in this latter part, Jesus says that those who expect him or those who are waiting, those who are watching and waiting for his coming, given all those conditions of a delay and of the need to use the talent and time, Jesus now says they will be found in this way. They will be found that they are taking care of those who are hungry, those who are thirsty, those who are, um, uh, are strangers, those who are naked and they are sick, and those who are in prison. I want to believe that Jesus intended not that this to be carried out as a program whereby I have to wait for a program of the church to fulfill what Jesus is saying. I would want to imagine that Jesus was laying this responsibility on every person who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen? Listen to what Sister White says about this particular uh, statement. Uh, listen to what she says. Uh, this is Christ Object Lesson, uh, page 360, oh, sorry, 326, paragraph 3. Uh, she says this. Christ's followers have been redeemed for service. Our Lord Jesus Christ teaches that the true object of life is ministry. Christ himself was a worker and to all his followers he gives the law of service. Service to God and to fellow men. Here Christ has presented to the world a high conception of of life than they had ever known. By living to minister to others, man is brought in connection with Christ. The law of service becomes the connecting link which binds us, binds us to God and to fellow men. He says this, to his servants, Christ commits his goods, something to be put to use for him. He gives to every man his work, and each has a place in the internal plan of heaven. Each is to work in cooperation with Christ for salvation of souls. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in heaven, mansions, than is a special place designated on earth where we are to work for the Lord. There's quite a lot that is laid out here, but I'm interested with the first section, uh, first sentence where he says Christ followers have been redeemed for service meaning our redemption is all but for service I know at times when we think of service we think of um, mission work far and wide but as we talk about community service could it just be that simple service to the community where the Lord has appointed us have you ever known that wherever you stay or the day we are living today, God has determined it for this particular purpose? I love a verse, Acts chapter 17. Read with me, Acts 17, talking about where you reside and the time you are living today as you are alive today. I do read this text in that context. And especially when I'm reading uh, to people in the manner in which they relate to what they do in their life of marriage. Acts 17, this is Paul speaking to um, uh, uh, the men of Athens, and he, he makes a statement that I want you to reflect on together with me. Acts 17 and verse 26. Listen what he says, verse 26. And he has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now listen to what he says, two things he says. And he has determined their times before appointed and the bonds, that's King James, 
but in some places the boundaries of their habitation hmm. think about it that wherever you are staying today God determined before time talking about God's call for service God has determined you could be staying somewhere it doesn't matter you could be aspiring to go and stay somewhere else but just start from where you are where you stay today and appreciate the fact that God has appointed your geographical locations your pastor your elder anybody else may not know where you stay but God has appointed your boundaries and I want to believe that one of the reasons and which is alluded in verse 27 is that he has appointed you in that place for service you know I read of a book of one man who rose up and left his homestead to go into a far country because he he was told that in the far country where he had to go there was gold so he leaves his home packs and goes to the place where he was told that there's gold the interesting part of the story just to cut it short is that when he reaches that place he found the people who dwell there also having uh, uh, set up a journey to come to the place where he had left because they were told that where he stayed there's gold you know, we live in days of celebrities. Even ministry has become a celebrity. We want to go in far country where we'll be celebrated. But God has appointed you in the place where you dwell that you may minister. And yet it's a challenge indeed, taking from what Jesus says that a prophet is not accepted in his own place. But it, just, take it, just think about it, that wherever you are, that place where you live, there is ministry. Ministry is not done when only we go far. Ministry is done where God has appointed you to dwell. And that's why the servant of the Lord, Sister White, bless it, um, makes it so plain that Christ followers are redeemed for service. And our, the, our teacher says that the true object of life is ministry. I have come to discover for the short years of my life that life is only at its best when it is intended for the betterment of other human beings. That when I a purpose to invest in other people, then my life is at its best. Think about our lives today as people. Look at the depression rate. Look, in fact, yesterday speaking with my guest pastor, we were just driving and you we were saying about the rates which have not been reported amidst the children of God of suicides or people taking their lives, what is the cost of it? Self-centered life. When you begin to think more of what it is about me, life becomes depressing. But when you turn your sight out, you begin to have a fulfilled life. Amen? Actually, ministry is not so much about what we intend to get out of it, but what more happens to you when you get involved in whatever ministry, small as it is, you will find a total transformation in your life. I do tell people, for many of you who know that I, I get much interest in marital issues, but I tell uh, couples that when you purpose in your marriage life for the betterment of your partner, marriage just becomes different. But when it becomes about you, marriage becomes stressful. And I think that principle applies also even to our calling to ministry. So Jesus here tells us that he was hungry and you gave him food, that he was thirsty, you gave him drink, and he was a stranger and you invited him, a ministry unto the other people. Now in this passage, uh, we see practical um, highlights of service of others. Uh, serving others with compassion Jesus is addressing the needs of food, drink, clothing hospitality, healthcare visitation and he emphasizes the active ministry of those who are marginalized you know here at home uh, these things of the needs of the people I think is yet to hit at so hard uh, to an extent that like a church's new life I would imagine would also transform uh, their trajectory of ministry you know 
by friends who are doing ministry out there share with us today that no one will stand in, you can't stand in the street and start preaching and people would come listening to you. No one. But the way they are now doing it is that they ensure that the people who are out and marginalized are given a place of belonging. They are accepted into the community of God's children. And the way they are accepted is by hospitality, clothing, health cares, and visitations. And ultimately, many people begin to come in. I'm imagining if a place like New Life would purpose to have just a storehouse in one of our rooms of our best, not the ones that are now chakara, but the, my best of clothes where people in the streets could come and find clothing or a church which is capable like New Life could purpose to have a feeding program. I know some of those things are happening, but I sometimes imagine that we do them as hit and run. You know what I mean? I do it once and then I count on it like men in marriage sometimes do great things for their wives and then they count that they have shown love until another time again. And imagine that they love their wives not knowing that the woman wants to be shown love every other moment, not only once in a big way, you know. Have you ever imagined, man, that you buy your wife a Mercedes-Benz of 12,000 million, let's say, that's a lot of money over and above. I may not know the cost of a Benz, but, and you imagine you sit back and you say, I bought her a Benz, and you count it down. And then along the way, you have not done any other thing, and she behaves like you have not done anything. And rightly so, because my mom told me something that I've discovered 28 in marriage, that for a woman, you buy her Benz, and you give her a tropical, you two shillings, those things are all the same. Because it's not about the object, it's about the act. So they always have a bank that you should deposit continually, not one big lump sum thing. Not that they don't need the big lump sum thing, but when it's only done as an act, then for that matter, it doesn't count. I'm saying this just to relate it to the life of ministry in the church. We could do something big and we count that, okay, we did it. Three months ago, we did it. Not knowing and not realizing that in a sense, this ought to be the life of a Christian. So let's just, um, I guess... I was told just 25 minutes, uh, but let me just speak out a few things uh, that I can be able to glean from this story. What are some of the principles in these two texts in Matthew 20, Matthew 25 verse 35 that Jesus would wish to highlight in regards to community needs? Number one, in talking about feeding, hungry, and clothing, Jesus seems to tell me that I need to identify the needs in my community. It could just be food, it could just be clothes, but Jesus says we, I need to engage with the community and identify what are the specific needs because food, clothing, and uh, shelter, these are the very basic things of life. So Jesus is saying, can you pay attention? Can you get involved in the things around you so that you can partner into uh, answering that need. That's number one. As I read Jesus saying, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked. Jesus is just saying, can, me, can I, am I concerned? You see, like our story in the morning of the Samaritan, you know, when you read the story of the Samaritan, all the four characters they saw but it's only the Samaritan that saw and got in contact. So when we say we need to identify the needs, it doesn't mean that the needs are not there. They are there, but who is seeing like the Samaritan and getting in contact? Number two, again, Jesus seems to uh, be challenging um, in the saying, I was hungry and thirsty. Jesus seems to be suggesting that I need to be in, uh, I, I need to be, um, I, I need to be intentional in, 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 in raising or mobilizing resources that could serve my community. Just the mere fact that Jesus says he's hungry and he's thirsty and he says what I did for the little ones, 
I hear or I read and see that Jesus desires that given that that is a continual thing, that is a present need, then it should be part of my program. Meaning I should establish something like a food bank that would be able to support that need because it's not going away, it's there. In fact, as I'm speaking, I'm just thinking of how uh, the narration takes on, on how it is said, whether it is said in a, a continuous sense. But I'm imagining Jesus saying, this need, Aita Toka, it's continual. Can you just think of a way whereby you are serving it? You know, hallelujah, children of God. So number one, identify it, but can you also initiate a means in which you are going to minister, not a one-off, not a hit and run. You know what I mean? Sometimes services in the church I do, it's like I hit and run. I do it once, I wait for another convenient time, I, de I do it, and then I'm gone. Jesus seems to say that these people who are hungry and thirsty and naked identify with him. He says, I was hungry. I was naked. What I see in that sense is the need of relationships. Relationships. As we spoke in the morning, some of these community things are not going to be done because of your religion. Are they not going to be done also just because it's a responsibility that you need to do, but it's out of built relationship. Can I be able to build meaningful relationship that involves genuine, gen, sorry, genuine care and empathy for people who are in need. Can, you, can I build genuine relationship with people uh, that I may minister to them in that sense? You know, sometimes thinking about the needs in the society can be very frustrating. But God helped me, and I hope it will help somebody to think about through it. Uh, there is a time when Jesus speaks about the days of the prophets and says there were many widows in that day, but the prophet of God ministered to only one widow. Then I said, okay, okay. This could be the way God is calling me to respond to my immediate neighbor, meaning there were many widows in those days, but only one received the prophet. And I have come to understand, yes, there are many people in need, but God calls me to respond only to one. And taking a statement from some leadership guru who says that if every one of us could clean in front of your house, the whole world will be clean. Meaning if I could only take care of my, my front door, you know, takataka ile kombele ya nyumba yangu, peke yake, basi dunia nzima, imagine wewe na wewe na wewe na wewe na wewe, kila moja shugulikie sehemu ya nyumba yako, then my neighbor will find it and also then the whole world will be clean so sometimes you know we fall back because of the you know the overwhelming need that seems to be there but think about it if every one of us responds to my immediate call of service then the whole world probably will be answered Jesus says that uh, you know in, in, as you read, it says, I was naked, I was, and then he says, you did not. There is a sense in which I see Jesus also speaking about collaboration and partnership. Yes, we all need to build these relationships, but again, we realize we can't do it alone. And that's why we thank God for the church. And we thank God for our different ministries in the church. Adventist men, women ministries, children ministries, in those collaboration, working together and bringing together our resources, I guess, as a church, we would find ourselves answering the need of the community. So the men ministry, just to finish up by giving this practical uh, suggestion, the Adventist men responding to the community need, engaging and utilizing. These are some things which are very strange, but imagine... Some people are doing them in other places. I'm imagining men ministry engage in constructive projects, construction projects, home repairs of the needy, uh, mentoring young men, 
uh, participating in outreach programs aimed at supporting and empowering men in challenging life situations. I'm just thinking of that. You know, men purposing for one time, uh, having identified the need somewhere and uh, built a relationship with the people and moving out there just to, to respond to a need maybe of a construction of a house um, or to repair certain houses or to mentor certain uh, people. You know, I don't want to compare, but we're just giving credit where it belongs. I'm waiting for a day. I know we have ADRA as, 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 um, as an institution in our church that responds to community needs. But I'm waiting for a day where all our churches, yes, with the fans that we govern and we bring together, our churches, we could also have, you know, respond um, a rescue, um, rescue departments uh, that are going to reach out. Last time when, uh, let me not go there, let me leave it at that, Adventist men. Then I go to women ministry and think of women ministry can actively participate in community service utilizing their nurturing and caregiving abilities. I'm thinking of this, initiating things like providing meals for homeless. I know we do them. Remember what I said? They happen sometimes as a hit and run organizing, you know, intentionally in quarter or in month, organizing clothing drives for women and children, visiting the sick, like the mission, you know, when this friend came from California, picked me in Nairobi, he was just one single man, he's a retired doctor, but he, he saves money, then comes over for ministry, and he told me, um, this is the way he wants to do ministry, so he came over, and we went down in Mumias, and, uh, uh, we found a certain Sunday, uh, th this is a Sunday church, and then we found a pastor, and then that pastor invited us to preach in his church, and then later on, he took us to the community and to minister to people with jiggers. Then I looked at this guy, this friend of mine, I started saying, is he very rich? I said, no, he's a retired doctor. Yes, he was a doctor, but he's a retired doctor, so he does not have much money. What is happening with him? One thing that challenged me, and I say this to my shame, um, he had traveled from California with a, a backpack, backpack only. First of all, he was putting on a jeans, and he had one pair of shoes, and he carried some t-shirts and a jacket to feel cold. A pastor from Nairobi, carried three suits, two pair of shoes. And you can imagine any other thing. Then I started saying, it's not that we don't have money. It's just where we have placed our priorities. In fact, every moment I was being tempted, if I could even just leave my, one of my suit in Kakamega, and I was wondering which one. But I realized that many of the people who come and minister with us, they are not the rich. It's just that they have realized where life really matters. I think having been a doctor all the while, and he told me, actually, you know, I told him I need more grace to reach their brother. But, he, you know, he had bought a house with a swimming pool and all that. Other. But now he said he had sold it and he's staying in a smaller house and he's using part of that investment for why he's in Kenya. So anyway, ch uh, children of God, my challenge is when we talk about women initiating some of these things, and I know, I know, I have four women in my house. When I talk about women and clothes, I'm not speculating. I know. But I'm imagining if every woman could also just have just the clothes necessary. Uh, Sister White challenges me that if you have a cloth in your wardrobe that you don't put on after one month, that cloth will stand against you. Children ministry, our young and the youth, the youth can involve in community service at the age appropriate ways. They can participate in having, um, collecting school supplies for underprivileged students and visiting nursing homes. I know these things we do them, but remember my challenge is whether we do them hit and run and spend time with the elderly local uh, youth can also organize community outreach projects and other social um, campaigns. 
um, which uh, let me not raise them, but that is my challenge for us this evening, and I hope that it will make sense to us. God bless. Is there any question? I don't know whether I'm the one supposed to, to, to initiate the discussion. But uh, yeah, any question? Okay, I'm told just one. Seems I offshoot my time. Okay, sorry. Any question, please? Any response? Not even a question. Just a response to engage into this. Uh, somebody is there. Yes, please go ahead. I may not be seeing, but I see somebody showing me that there's somebody showing a hand just behind there. Please help with it. Um, with the mic. As the panelist come, please. Sante, sante pastor kwa mambo mema tu ambayo umeweza kutuletea wakati huu uh, ni kujaribu tu kutilia mkazo asante uh, kuwa ukristo si kuja kanisa na kukaa na kuelewa uh, sheria na kujaribu kueleza wengine kuhusu sheria mm -hmm. ama kwa kawaida tu kujaribu kuwa religious mm -hmm. in our practices normal practices mm -hmm. vile tulikuwa umeeleza hata awali lakini hata ukiangalia kitabu cha James aha uh -huh. uh, moja 27 mm. ambayo inaongelea kuhusu pure religion mm. na undefiled religion certainly before God ambapo nasema haya mambo yote ambayo umeweza kuyazungumza mm, kweli uh, visiting the fatherless and mm. widows in the affliction mm. and keeping oneself unspotted from the world na message yenye pia iko echo kule mathi wa mathiko tumesoma lakini sasa nilikuwa na na katini nikiwaza najiuliza kama biblia inasema kuwa pure religion and undefiled before god ni haya yote kutembelea wale hawana baba na widows na kule Matthew pia kuna vile Kristo anasema mm -hmm. wewe huku kuja kuniangalia nikiwa prison wewe nilikuwa sina nguo huku nipa mm. basi wewe ufai katika ufalme wangu basi nikiweka hizi vitu pamoja kuja kanisa basi ina maana gani hawa tuseme tu basi eh wewe mm -hmm. ukiwa na hela zako au mali hivi mm -hmm. awe chukua haya basi fanya nini tembelea wale ambao wako na, <laughs> wale wako prison Ununulia wale hawana nguo nguo mm -hmm. au wape chakula wale hawana mm -hmm. basi utakuwa maliza story kwa sababu mm -hmm. gani mm -hmm. utakuta kuna watu wengi hawa hawaji kanisa lakini wanafanya mambo haya mm -hmm. kwa kikubwa basi mm -hmm. so tukijaribu kupima kwa ratili tuseme basi upande huo ambao watu wanafanya haya mambo lakini waendi kanisa basi wako sawa kwa sababu kumbuka ni huyu Kristo ndiye anasema hapa sasa uko ufalme wa mbingu mm, eh? mm. anasema huku kuje kuniangalia huku fanya nini hajasema huku ti sheria huku enda kanisa huku fanya nini unaona mm, mm. James pia hapa anasema mm. pure eh? and undefiled religion do he mm, mm. sasa basi katika hii context ya discussion ya mm. kufanya mema na hata kukuja kwa kanisa na kufanya mambo mengine ambayo religion inataka mm. basi tunaweka wapi tunaweka mm. wapi utenda haya mm na kufanya mambo mengine ni nini haswa ina umuhimu katika ufalme wa mbingu asante ni swali yana upana kubwa na sitajidanganya kwamba nitajibu vizuri lakini ningependa kusema hivi jambo la kwanza ninaamini kwamba Kristo hatamani kwamba tendo lolote nalo litenda liniangaze mimi linafaa limwangaze yeye Yesu na njia ya pekee ambayo anaweza kutambulika ndiyo sababu niko kanisani ili wewe na yule na mwingine wakitenda mambo mema isionekane yule na mwingine ama mimi ionekane Kristo na hiyo inangaa katika kanisa watu wa Mungu wakiyatenda kwa jumla yote yanatendwa sio kwa ajili ya mtu 
lakini kwa ajili ya utukufu wa Mungu. Kwa hivyo kuwa kanisani na kutekeleza mambo hayo yote ni njema tena inafaa kwa sababu Bwana ndio pekee yake anafaa tukuzwe kwa hayo yote. Hivyo ndivyo naweza kufikiria. Lakini ndugu yangu labda naweza kuchangia. Yes my brother. God is good all the time. Uh, mine is uh, I think it is kind of a question. Uh, one of the key takeaway you've mentioned is about uh, identifying the need in the community. Right. So these are physical things at the end of yes. the day we are able to see. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask what about the invisible things that we are not able to tell. For example, mm -hmm. uh, here in church, mm -hmm. sometimes it is not possible for you to tell that there is need here or there is no need here. Mm -hmm. If someone does not come straight and say, I need help on some other issues. Yes. So if we are able to identify these visible needs mm. in the community, mm. then how are we able to identify the invisible, mm -hmm. more so in the church? Because at most, or in, sorry. Mm. So in most instances, uh, sometimes we have missions, we have uh, camp meetings that we usually do we go out to evangelize people, but at the end of the day, we need to start, before even going out to evangelize those people, we need to evangelize ourselves. There are Correct. so many souls that are supposed to be Correct. saved Evangel here. Yeah. There's, there's a context I read somewhere mm -hmm. that was saying, I think this is a, I am not saying it is, but I'm thinking and feeling it could be one of us that was outpouring some of their frustrations mm. here. They were saying uh, something to do with the, you go to church, mm -hmm. Uh, people will have their own lunch. Mm. They will not invite you for that lunch. Mm. People will be driving. Mm. They are driving towards your route, but mm. they will not lift you. Mm. So you see, from the other concept as well, these are some things that might be invisible to us. Mm. You could not be aware that this person, for sure, mm. they need to be given a right to the direction that I'm heading to, mm. or they need lunch. So my question is, how are we able to identify these invisible needs at the end of the day. Thank you. Another difficult question. However, this is how I look at it myself, from my place, that it is necessary for us to create a presence. Now, it's difficult on both sides. It's difficult for me as one who is challenged, who is confronted with that responsibility, that I need to create a presence, and the creating a presence means how vulnerable am I? How am I open? for somebody to find access to me. Remember the attitude of the religious people. And that is the attitude of us. It's not anything about the parable. That is the attitude of being religious. There is a sense in which we try to protect our space. Because first of all, you fear somebody to lead you into sin. So you try to just be in... We, we, we create concaves whereby I'm so... you know. I don't know who you are, I don't know how you walk, I don't know which food you eat, I don't know which water you drink. So I'm trying to protect my space. But interestingly, that's not the call of Christ. Christ is calling us for a free fall, vulnerability. And that is very difficult. So if we create the presence where we are, you know, if somebody, you know, people in church, even somebody in need cannot come to an individual when they realize that you are closed in, unless they're really dying. But if I allow the inevitable of my calling into Christianity to be vulnerable, which we fear, by the way, we fear, all of us fear that, we, we fear, you know, opening up, and yet that is a scandal of Christianity to open up. But we always have these fig leaves all around us and we still have to be protected. But if we create it individually in your space, you will find people coming. People will be opening up and telling you, brother, I slept hungry yesterday. Brother, I don't have a piece of cloth. Because they know you will protect their dignity. You know, you will give them value. But if it's all about, you know, they look at you, they see you're so careful with yourself, they keep off. So they would rather go to somebody, a Samaritan out there, who will look at them and still give them their dignity and minister to them. That's what I would think. Thank you so much. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we can allow the panelists to come in. 
God our Father in heaven, some things we speak to our own judgment and such as this. But I pray, O oh Lord, that still even then your spirit will convict us of righteousness and of the judgment to come that we may choose to live aright. To your glory, in Jesus' name we pray.